Hello and welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Glad you could be here. So, we finished off one series and so now we're uh, going to be talking. On, uh, we're just going to be going. <clears throat> now, today's service, today's thing is on a present need. A present need is to behold Christ. We need to behold Christ in everything we do. So, we're going to be beholding Christ. In Revelations 14.4, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. And in their mouth is found no guile. For they are without fault before the throne of God. <clears throat> I don't think anyone needs convincing of the very eminence of Christ's soon return. We already know that the world is really fraying at the edges. Everything has been prophesied about the coming of Jesus has taken place. Everything that the Bible talks about that it will be coming, is coming. And it's taken place. And now more than ever, we have a need to pay close attention to the words of Jesus. Matthew 24, 42, Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour our Lord doth come, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be always ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Look at all the prophecies in the Bible, the world events. Is it difficult to realize that Jesus is coming? And when he comes in the clouds of heaven, is that going to take us by surprise? Is it going to take you by surprise when he comes? I hope not. Um, but what time is it referred to? It's not to the revelations of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find people asleep. No, but to his return to his ministrations in the holiest place of the heavenly sanctuary. When he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance, and when the mandate goes forward, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So right now, this present day and age, where is Jesus at? He's in heaven doing the priestly things as our high priest. When Jesus ceased, when Jesus ceases to plead for mankind, when Jesus stops pleading for us, the cases of all are forever decided. This is the time of reckoning with his servants. To those who have neglected the preparation of purity and holiness, which fits them to be waiting ones to welcome their Lord, the sun sets in gloom and darkness and rises not again. Probation closes. Christ's intercession ceases in heaven. This time finally comes suddenly upon all. And those who have neglected to purify themselves, to purify their souls by obeying the truth, and are found sleeping, they become weary of waiting and watching. They become indifferent in regards to among their master. They long not for his appearing and thought there was no need of such continuing perverse, 
persevering, watching. Well, they have been disappointed in their expectations and they might be again. They conclude that there was a time enough yet to arise. They think that they have plenty of time to prepare. They, they think. But you know what? They would be sure not to lose the opportunity of securing an earthly treasure. And it would be safe to get all of this world they could... And in securing this object, they lose all anxiety and interest in the appearance of our master. They become indifferent and careless, as though his coming were yet in the distance. But while their interests are hinged and buried in worldly gain, the work closed in the heavenly sanctuary, and they're caught unprepared. To be sleeping means to be unconscious of Jesus finishing his work in heaven. And like in the days of Noah, when the door was shut, the people didn't have the opportunity then. They didn't have the opportunity to be protected from the flood. Once the door's shut, the door's shut. They don't open again. So it will be when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. The opportunity to meet him, to praise him, to meet, meet him in peace, is closed. Preparation of purity and holiness, that is what we should be occupying ourselves with. Purifying our souls. We need preparations of purity and holiness, that is what we should be accompanying, accomplishing. If we neglect that, we will be sleeping when he comes. When Jesus returns, what would be the condition of his people? When Jesus can come, and when Jesus can say, I come now, what will his people be like? Jesus is waiting with longing a longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly, perfectly, perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to them that claim to be his own. But when will he come? Well, he'll come when his character is revealed. In his people. Can you wonder why there's a delay? What are the 144,000 that's talked about in Revelations? Well, they are without fault before the throne of God. The work of the gospel is to produce a character in the life of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.25 Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might satisfy and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Before Jesus can come, he wants to see a people who have been benefited by his gospel. When he sees a church without spot and wrinkle, without sin, without any sin, then he will come to take them home. That is what he's waiting for. In order for us to be like the Savior, we must change. And that is what the gospel of Christ is all about. We must be pure. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. 
But our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the work whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now is the time for us to bring into the daily life the virtues of Christ's life. We have no time to lose. Should we fail in our character building, we shall lose eternal life. We must build on the true foundation. We must do the work of Christ and be constantly watching and praying. Then we will then we shall be ready for his appearing. And we will be prepared for eternal life. You know, I don't know how close Christ is coming. How close is the coming of Christ? I have no clue. I cannot see when the end will be coming. And how close can you see it coming to an end? See, this is what my mind is. This is what activates my mind. Is what I have just read here. That for me to be like Jesus, for me to be ready for him to come, I must change. And I know I need to change. And I'm working on my change. We've got little time, and we must change. We cannot be faulty any longer. All those who take this seriously will follow the research that I'm going to share. And I'm going to be doing a series. It's coming up here. But we... uh. It's, I'm just going to do a series on close of probation, the work that we need to take care of in ourselves, and each step, I'll be going along with it. So, right now is what is our present need? Well, our present need is to obey the truth, to attend Attending diligently and developing a purity and faultless in our character. And in such an intense time in which we live now. You know, in Amos 4.12, Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. You know, we need to meditate on this. We need to meditate on young people and children in the drama of what is going to be when Jesus actually comes onto this planet. It's going to be a horrendous. People are going to be crying. Let the rocks fall on us, you know? There's going to be catastrophes worse than we've ever seen. As you see yourself in a terrible plight coming up before you, say to yourself, I'm going to be saved from this and be very particular that I am going to come out all right on the right side of the scene. My question for you is, what are you doing in the great work of preparation? Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly molds and preparing for the seal of God on their foreheads. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain consistent, will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. 
It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of a man or woman of false tongues or a deceitful heart. Who will receive the seal must be without spot before God. He is asking us individually, what are you doing to prepare to see Jesus in the clouds of heaven? What are you doing? Isn't it this a precious privilege of ours to be a candidate of heaven? We stand before God and offer ourselves. My question for you is, are you doing it? Many have grown up in a religious world that has proclaimed Jesus is coming. We have seen a state of religious empathy. Very few and those few get tired as they grew up. Listening and watching. What about you? What are you doing? Every individual soul if you would receive the seal of the living God, must hear the word the Lord and do it with exactitude. When you hear something from God's word, what is the empathy that affects us today? Yeah, you could say, oh, I know, I know, I know. I know what I need to do, but I'm not ready. I'm, I just... I need to, wait a minute, can you actually afford to think like that? If Jesus is waiting, he could come at any moment. The world is already on its last legs, you can see it. Right now the angels are holding back the winds of strife. We are living on borrowed time. The angels could have given up a long time ago. But Jesus is waiting and waiting. Here we live today on the very cusps of the final destruction. And what are we doing about it? Yeah, I know. We go to church every Sunday. And then home every Sunday. And then continue in the normal round and stave off. The conviction that comes to us. But what are you actually doing? We hear the word of the Lord. And doing it with exactitude. No haphazard religion. None of this business of. Oh. Later when I feel like it. Maybe when I'm ready. We need to be ready. There must be no such thing as a haphazard religion. If men and women would have a place in the family of God, now is the time. While the angels are holding the four winds to make our calling and election sure. We can't be empathy. We must change. We must overcome those character defects. And there is no time to lose. We hear the word of the Lord and do it with exactitude. You know, this message is coming to us in a time when God says, here is a problem with the church in this time. The message is, is what does he say about his people who are living in the last period of the Christian church? Like the period that we're living in right now, right before Jesus comes. Revelations 3.14 And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou were hot or cold. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What is he saying in the... What do you... What is he saying about the condition of the people in which we are a part of? We're not hot nor cold. 
I'm lukewarm. Are you lukewarm for Jesus? We are surrounded by lukewarm people. Surrounded by lukewarm stepped water, spiritually speaking. You know the story of the frog. As that the water heats up, he doesn't know when to get out, and he dies in it. Revelations 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. If any man. In the midst of this lukewarm people, he says, I'm knocking. Will anyone open up for me and let me in? Remember, the church is as his woman. These are the words that Jesus is referring to when he says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Songs of Solomon 5.2 I sleep, but my heart waketh. The voice of my beloved that knocketh, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, my locks with the drips of the night. Isn't it this the case of Jesus in Gethsemane? His brows heavy with dew, drops of sweat. Now comes this language response. Songs of Solomon 5.3 I have put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the holy, and my bowels are moved for him. I am asleep, I don't feel like getting up. I can see his head coming on the door. In the old days the doors had a latch and a hole. He is really hard, to, he is really trying hard to come in. Songs of Solomon, five one or five five. Sorry, I rose up to open my beloved to op to open to my beloved, and my hand droppeth with myrrh or drippeth dropped with myrrh, and my fingers sweet smell in myrrh, the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, my, but my beloved had withdrawn himself, was gone. My soul fell it. Failed when he spake. I saw him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Can you see the behavior here? His church. This is the deplorable state of God's people among whom we have grown up with. To keep our hearts in heaven will give vigor to all our grace and put life into all our duties. We need to discipline our minds to dwell upon heavenly things. To put life and the earnesty into all our endeavors. Our efforts are languished and we run the Christian race. But we run it slowly. And manifest in dull, dullness and sloth. Because we so little value the heavenly prize. We are dwarfs in spiritual matters or attainments. It is the privilege and duty of Christians to be increasing in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. You know the race of the hare and the tortoise. We're not the hares, but the tortoise. What is the Word of God speaking to us today? A great need. The reality of what the Word of God is telling me to do, I say, yeah, later. I'll come to the door soon. I'm just quite too sleepy right now. But thank you very much. You know, that is something that we see around us constantly. Continually. If we knew we were being chased down by a lion and he's not far behind, what would you do? Would you run for your life? It's time to get that adrenaline a rush going. We are covered in the dust of living a normal life. Isaiah 52 1. Awake, awake, put on the strength of Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth 
There shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyselves from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Lose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. We are being held down. We are being bound by Satan's sophistries, sophistications, and it's putting us to sleep. So awake, shake yourself, get out of this condition. The word of God and the powerful supplements, we can read it in God's word. So in order to understand this matter rightly, we must remember that our hearts are naturally deprived and we are unable of ourselves to pursue the right course. It is only by grace of God, combined with the most earnest effort in our part, that we can gain victory. You know, it's actually natural for us to be lukewarm. It's hard for us to arouse ourselves, to get going. And we need the grace of God combined with our efforts to get going, to arouse ourselves. Every wrong tendency, tendency, maybe through the grace of God, repressed not in a language, ir irresponsible manner, but with the firmness of purpose, with high resolution to make Christ the pattern. We cannot get there by say, yeah, yeah, all right, whatever manner. Maybe later manner. We must be filled with the resolution reaction to the challenge that this life gives us. We are naturally deprived. We've grown up in this condition. We, uh, we actually let our love go out for those things that Jesus loved and be withheld from those things that will give no strength to right impulses. With determined energy, we seek to learn and to improve our character every day. We must have firmness of purpose to take our, ourselves in hand and be what you know God wants you to be. And the work that we do on ourselves will be a great pleasure to God. And God would be pleased to have you. So what is the Lord telling us today? What is he saying to us today? He's saying, get yourself in hand. That is what he's saying. Get a hold of yourself. Get into the action to put away the things that Jesus doesn't love. <clears throat> the follower of Christ should not indulge in any gratifications or engage in any enterprise, however innocent or plottable it may appear. Um, if anything which enlightens consciousness tells him would abate his adore or lessen his spirituality. <coughs> now, I am not telling you what to do. I am just sharing with you what God is telling me. There are little things that we indul indulge in. I know I indulge in a few things that I probably shouldn't. And they actually harm us more than they do us good. And Satan is there continually placing things so laudable that's so harmless, or at least it seems harmless. And it seems like there's nothing wrong with what it's, what's going on. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing. But it is weakening us from getting ready for Jesus. <clears throat> Every Christian should labor to press back the tide of evil and save our youth from the influences that would sweep them down to ruin. 
with God's help, we can press our way against the current. Now, young people, I'm talking about ages 17 to 30. <coughs> when your parents are telling you what to do, don't become impatient. All those who are mothers and fathers in Israel and in the world, listen to the Father in heaven. It's time to respond what to do and respond with clarity. We are living at the edge of destruction and we are being put to sleep. We live in such a lovely country. We are on the destructive edge and we are sitting back and Jesus is trying hard to come in <coughs> with high res resolve to make Christ the pattern. Without making Christ the pattern, you are not going to get there even if you try. If you don't use Christ as a pattern, you will not get where you need to go. Making Christ the pattern is the only way we can change so that when people see you, they see Christ. We don't want them seeing us. We want them seeing Christ. So we have to change so they see Christ when they look at us. <coughs> In 1 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with open face boldness, is in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. So if you don't make a high res resolve to make Christ your pattern, you're not going to change. <clears throat> we need to look intently with great earnesty on Jesus because we're going to die if we don't. If we do not look on Jesus and do what Jesus asks us to do, we will die. As one who becomes acquainted with the history of the Redeemer, we discover in ourselves serious defects. Our unlikeliness to Christ is so great that we see the necessity for a radical change in our lives. And still we study with a desire to become like a great exemplar. We try to catch the looks, the spirit of our beloved Master by holding by by beholding, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we become changed unto his image. It is not by looking away from him that we imitate the life of Christ, but by talking of him, by dwelling upon his perfections, by seeking to refine the taste and the elevation of character by trying through faith and love and persevering to the approach of the perfect pattern. Having the knowledge of Christ, His words, His habit, His lessons in those instructions, you know the instructions in the Bible? <coughs> we borrow the virtues of the character we have so closely studied. And then we become endued with His Spirit. We have so much admiration for Jesus that Jesus becomes uh, to us the chiefest among 10,000. So if you need a rival, a rousing, a awakening, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Occupy your mind with him and you will be you will get a fright let me tell you that you will get a fright to see your condition your true condition you will be brought to study his beautiful characteristics that you will become changed it is not ours to concentrate on me and I must change myself, but it is ours to keep Jesus and concentrate with intensity on Him. Now, 
<coughs> Excuse me. So, how intently do you think we should be looking at Christ? Well, we change from day to day from our own ways and will unto the ways and will of Christ, unto the loveliness of his character. Thus we will grow up in Christ and unconsciously reflect his image. We won't say, I'm a better person now. We won't say nothing like that, no. Our concentration is not upon ourselves, and it is not how well we're doing. Okay? Our concentration um, will never change you if you're concentrating on yourself. Comparing yourself with others will not work either. You can't compare a, def a person's defect with your defects because they're two different defects. You can't look at someone and compare yourself to someone else. <coughs> so, we have to become like Jesus. And the only way we can become like Jesus is by looking at Him alone. Then we will change. We will imperceivably change We will change unconsciously to his character. We will be reflecting his image. And as we look at him, and as we continue working towards him, we will see our own defects. We won't say, oh, I'm doing well there. The Lord will continue changing us. Our focus is to concentrate on the vision that is going to change me. And that is what we will be doing with the words that I'll be sharing for the next couple of weeks. So we look intently upon Jesus. And as we do this, we need to look at it that many people are at the same position and will stay at the same position if I'm never going to change because I'm too weak. Let's contemplate on the aspects of Christ. So, why was Jesus crucified? 2 Corinthians 13.4 For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by power of God, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. So what did I just read about Jesus? That he was weak. Did you ever know that? So, why did he die? Because of weakness. He was weak as you and me. But he lived a perfect life. And why was he living a perfect life? It said it here. He lived by the power of God. Gaze and wonder at that picture. He, the God of the universe, came down and became weak with you and me. He, the mighty God, encased human flesh. And as he hung there on the cross, as he hung there as a weak, helpless, sinful human being, yeah, I'll prove it in the Word of God, of course. Straight from the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When God placed him in Gethsemane, what was he? He was sin. On him was laid the entire bundle of inequity that we all struggle with. It was on him. This is why he was crucified as weak as you and me. As you think about it, what must we change to become 
an image of Christ. Now you know that we are too weak and and as Jesus hung on the cross in our weakness we gaze upon this Romans 3 8 3 Romans 8 3 for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh so as we look upon Jesus, as we see him rithering in anguish in this weak human flesh that he was in, we see him at the cross with the law condemning him. He's agonizing in his absolute helplessness. He's suffering as a weakling, hanging there in the power of God. Matthew 6:34. Take therefore no thought for to the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day the evil thereof. So, in my weakness, I cling to him. In your weakness, cling to him. That was the experience of Jacob as he was struck in the side. He was so weak, but he clung on to Jesus. I will not let thee go unless thou bless me. Our dire present need is that I need to change. I must change. And I haven't got enough time to change into the image and character of Christ before he returns. We are too weak and it is too hard. Driven by our utter need, we are to gaze upon Jesus. We are to gaze upon his cross. Long enough to see his glory and to fill his power. And in that way, we will change. Lord, we just ask that you give us the power, give us the strength to keep looking upon Christ. And as we're gazing upon Christ, we just pray that you give us the ability to let you change us. And as we study your word and as we keep our focus on the prize, we shall change into what you'll be proud of. Lord, we just ask that you give us the strength that we need. In your loving name, amen.